So, continuing our slow, extended look at the Essex class, today we're going to take a brief overview of some of the more unusual uses that these ships were put to, especially later on in their careers. With the US Navy experimenting with larger and larger carriers to accommodate larger and larger aircraft, the Essexes began to look a little bit small, as although the various refits pushed the Essexes displacement up from 33 to 36 and eventually to just over 46,000 tonnes for some of the later refits, the Midways had started at 45,000 tonnes baseline and would eventually reach 64,000 tonnes by the end of their service lives. Next, in the mid-50s, came the first Forrestals, which would also mark the end of the straight-deck carrier in the US Navy, as Forrestal and Saratoga would become the last ships of their type to be laid down as straight-deck carriers, although they were converted to angle-deck ships before finishing construction. These ships displaced 60,000 tons tons empty and could tip the scales at over 81,000 tons fully loaded, as would the follow-on variants, the Kitty Hawks. The first nuclear-powered carrier, USS Enterprise, tipped the scales at just over 93,000 tons fully loaded, and the 1970s would see the debut of the Nimitz class, which managed to break that magical 100,000 ton barrier. The Essexes, or at least some of them, which remained in service, saw the introduction of all of these ships. So with the US Navy sailing around with multiple carriers that approached or exceeded twice their displacement even after refit, the use of the Essex class as frontline units began to be minimised, especially as their dimensions, although very generous by World War II standards, began to preclude them in later years from operating the latest aircraft, such as the F-4 Phantom II, and where they could operate modern aircraft, they could of course carry fewer of them. The first non-conventional carrier role that the class was put to was perhaps obvious, if a little extravagant, turning an entire fleet carrier, albeit now a smaller one, into an anti-submarine vessel equipped with copious numbers of fixed and rotary wing anti-submarine aircraft, in addition to a small force of lightweight fighters for self-defence. This started early on, with the remaining unconverted straight-deck Essex class taking up this role in the early 1950s, before gradually being di displaced later in the decade as they retired by the slightly upgraded 27A model Essexes, which were still straight-deck but had a number of changes to armament, aircraft lifts and the like. This in turn freed up the larger, more modern aircraft carriers to concentrate on fighter and strike roles, since the US Navy in the 1950s and 1960s was still made up of large numbers of 1940s era ships in various states of upgrade, in addition to its more modern units, and these older ships generally did not possess the facilities to support full anti-submarine operations in the modern context, which of course now included sonar-equipped helicopters to move the search mission out beyond the fleet its perimeter. It also allowed the concentration of command and control efforts in this regard, which was much more efficient use of resources as compared to a wild mix of escorting ships, with probably fewer total aircraft in all, all going off on their own individual anti-submarine hunts. Additionally, in the era of early guided weapons, it was fairly important to be able to vector in a number of additional aircraft at short notice in case the first shot missed or failed to function. Some of the baseline model ships displaced by the 27As would ditch fixed-wing operations almost completely and were in turn repurposed as helicopter assault ships for the US Marine Corps, initially supplemented by the Iwo Jima class, which were purpose-built assault ships, but of significantly smaller size. The Essexes in this role were then edged out by the significantly larger Tarawa and Wasp classes, which were in the same size range as the Essexes themselves, a little bit further down the line in time. Their unique combination of lots of hangar and deck space, long endurance, high range, and a relative lack of need for them on frontline operations also meant that the Essexes found a role as spacecraft, and hopefully space crew, recovery ships. The Valley Forge, Lake Champlain, Randolph, Intrepid, Kearsarge, Wasp, Boxer, Bennington, Yorktown, Essex, 
Ticonderoga and Princeton all took part at various points, picking up manned and unmanned capsules from the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo and Skylab programs. Hornet, however, would gain the most fame in this regard, picking up an unmanned Apollo test vehicle before successfully recovering the Apollo 11 and 12 moon landing crews. This was especially notable as NASA did not know if the astronauts would bring back some new and exotic disease or similar pathogen from the moon, and so a portion of the ship's hangar was set aside for a medically isolated decontamination chamber, which was itself converted from a rather fetching, rounded and shiny Airstream trailer, where the crew would have to stay whilst the ship, likewise, remained quarantined at sea until it became clear that to the scientists of the time, that the moon plague was either not real, or at the very least would only affect communists. Outside of museum ships, the longest surviving member of the class was the Oriskany, which would become the US Navy's first artificial reef in 2006, when it was towed out to sea and sunk by carefully placed demolition charges, forming the so-called Great Carrier Reef, and providing a popular local destination for both fish to make a home, and divers to go and have a unique look. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.